And really, that's what I want you to be able to answer those questions at the end of this lecture. And that's what this lecture is designed to do. First, I'm going to introduce why do we do it? Why do I think it's important? And then I'm going to address the question which I often get. I get phone calls about, people send me emails. When is the best age to disclose to a child? I think that hopefully by the end of this lecture, all of you will be able to answer that question. And then how? Now, you're not like, you may not become an expert on disclosing uh, to a child by the end of this lecture, but it will teach you a process that you can do and start to get comfortable with it and start practicing it uh, in your own clinics. Okay. So is there evidence out there that disclosing is actually beneficial or is it actually harmful? Lots of parents, lots of caregivers are very worried about disclosing to a child. They say, well, if I disclose to a child, they're going to get upset, they're going to stop taking their medicines. They're going to get depressed if I tell them why they take their medicines. They're going to get upset. Well, the evidence is actually the opposite of that. That is actually not what happens. It's actually the opposite of that. And where do we get this? Well, there's some evidence from disclosing to children with cancer, with chronic, potentially fatal diseases. There's some from HIV, infected children. And then there's ex expert opinions. And then what actually happens? There's, uh, actually, I haven't updated this, this, but there are now a few published studies from Africa showing that there is benefit in disclosing uh, to children. And... and, and it's what we feel uh, as doctors. You can see it in changing in a child. You can see it even in their own family dynamics. So why do we do it? Well, in general, children with chronic illnesses like cancer, like HIV, like diabetes, and have life-threatening diseases, they benefit from early disclosure. The more you tell them in a method that they can understand, the better they feel about themselves. It's not a secret anymore. And there's special cultural and social conditions that complicate the que questions with regard to HIV, particularly stigma. Now with cancer, if a child has a fatal or life-threatening cancer and they need to undergo chemotherapy, even that, lots of parents, lots of caregivers are afraid to disclose to a child, to tell them that they have this very serious condition that is life-threatening. But when you add HIV onto it, there's stigma associated with HIV. When you tell a child they're HIV infected, well, that has implications for the mother because she, that likely is telling the status that their mother is HIV infected. So this complicates things. It's even more difficult to do than other chronic childhood illnesses. So why should we do it? Well, one, because a child will have a better understanding of their medical condition without which they might not understand what's likely to happen to them in the future. What are they to expect because of their illness? What might happen to them? What are some possible side effects of the medicine? Untreated, what can possibly happen to them? They get better psychosocial adjustment and self-esteem. Now, this has actually been proven in some research study that children who are disclosed to at an early age, they have higher self-esteem. They feel better about themselves. They have less depression. So the, another benefit is then that they can become open in medical decision making. And they can become involved in discussions about HIV. They can become involved in a support group. One of the criteria for coming to my teen clinic is that they're fully disclosed to. I had a child who was 14 come to my clinic yesterday for the first time and was not disclosed. How do you begin that process? Well, this child already had made it up to 14 years and all this time couldn't receive any social support, couldn't attend any peer group counseling because he didn't know he was HIV positive. So all of that time building up, you know, and not being able to get the support that he needed for 14 years. Remember in our video that we saw about the children with HIV. Remember Eva. She was the girl in the red dress. She was 13 uh, in that video, 
She said that she was only told that she was HIV positive when she was 12. But yet, her caregivers knew she was positive when she was two. She said that was one of the most distressing things. If you remember, she was crying during this part of the interview. She said, my parents knew since I was two years old, but they never told me. All that time, they were keeping secrets from me for 10 years. All of that support she could have gotten. You can see that this was very distressing for her. Not the fact that she had HIV, but the fact that it was kept secret from her. That was what upset her. All of that time, she could have been receiving support from her family, from counselors, from peer groups. But she couldn't because she didn't know she had HIV. There's potential for increased adherence. How is that possible? How is the potential for increased adherence if you know why you're taking treatment? Well, what commonly happens when I find an older child who's not disclosed to and they're not taking treatment properly, I ask them, well, why are you taking treatment? As I mentioned earlier this morning, the number one reason I get is because I'm sick. And then I ask them, well, do you feel sick? They say, no. Well, then how are you sick? They say, I don't know. I say, well, then why are you not taking medicines? Because I don't think I need them. I don't feel sick. I was told I take medicines because I'm sick, but I'm not sick. So I don't take my medicines. So if they know why they're taking medicines, they understand why they're taking medicines, then they can understand why they need to take medicines and have better adherence if they understand the process. There's increased opportunities for peer support. How can you attend a teen clinic, a teen support group, if you don't know you're HIV positive? You can't. That's why it's one of my criteria to attend the clinic. Because now, if you all know that you have HIV, you're open to talk about it. And they, kids in my clinic, they do. They talk very openly about it. They talk about the medicines. They talk about how do they take the medicines on weekends, sometimes when friends are visiting. How do they do that? Well, they can discuss with each other. How do they get through some of these problems that really are unique to being HIV positive and being a teenager? It can allow for closer relationship between the parent and the child or the caregiver. When there's secrets, that harms that relationship. There was a child who I disclosed to or began the process. She was 13 years old at the time and hadn't been disclosed to. Her mother had died of HIV and she was being cared for by her grandmother. At that time that we began the disclosure process, the grandmother said, I asked, what does the child know about HIV? She said, nothing. I said, have you told her anything about why she takes medicine? No, she hadn't said a word. So then I asked the child, why do you take your treatment. She said, because I have HIV. And the grandmother shot her head right to the child and said, what are you talking about? I never told you. She said, yes, but I've known for a long time. <laughs> so what did that do to the relationship between the grandmother and the child? All that time, the grandmother thinks she's keeping secrets. She's putting stress on that relationship. If she was open from the beginning, they could have built that relationship. Afterwards, this child actually, they had a very strained relationship for a while. Not because the child was HIV positive, but because the grandmother was not telling the child for all that time. The child knew she was HIV positive and knew that her grandmother was keeping it secret from her. That's what strained the relationship. If you start the process early, don't keep secrets, don't lie, there's no strain in that relationship can have a better relationship. And what I commonly see, and when there's a mother and a child taking treatment, I encourage them to take it at the same time. Take your treatment at the same time. The child sees you taking it, sees that the child is just like you. That often builds that relationship even stronger. You talk openly about HIV, talk openly about your medicines, that builds that relationship between the mother and the child or the family member and the child makes it a stronger bond. They understand better. That I'm not different from my mom. I have to take treatment just like she does, or just like my dad, or just like my other brothers and sisters. They take the treatment at the same time. 
that builds that relationship. And of course, once you start talking about it, there's no more secrets. Whenever there's secrets, there's a strained relationship. You're hiding things, you're not telling the truth. And that harms the situation. And once you're open about it, you can be free, free to talk open about it. So what's the risks of not disclosing if you don't tell a child? Well, as I said, they may not receive the needed support. They could have been coming to a teen clinic, could have been receiving teen support, they could have been going to counseling sessions, could have been possibly even seeing a psychologist and talking about it. But now they can't because they're not disclosed. And there's a depreciation in the child and parent communications and loss in confidence in the parents if you don't disclose. Early this morning I told you about a child who was taking treatment because she thought she had worms in her stomach. She was 13 at the time. She'd been taking treatment for a, a long period of time. And she'd actually been doing very well. As you would think, if you think you stop taking medicine and worms come and crawl out of your mouth, it's a very power incentive to take your treatment. But she can't believe that for her whole life. She has to learn the truth. So when we told her the truth, and told her that she took medicines for HIV, and not because she had worms in her stomach, guess what? She didn't take her treatment very well for a long time after that. Because there was a strain in the relationship between her, par her and her parents. Her parents had been lying to her, and she was mad at the doctors for allowing her parents to lie to her. She said, you knew I had HIV, why didn't you tell me? And my parents were telling me it was because I had worms in my stomach, but you knew I had HIV, why didn't you tell me I had HIV? So without that, it strains and they lose confidence in the parents. After that, the child actually had behavior problems. Before that, she was actually okay. Why did she have behavior problems? She didn't trust her parents anymore. They'd been lying to her all this time about this. Well, what else had they been lying to her about? Were there other secrets that she didn't know about? Makes a big strain in that relationship, doesn't it? Finding out in an uncontrolled and traumatic situation. If you're keeping it a secret from the child, but the child is coming to an HIV clinic once a month, what are the chances they're going to find out in that clinic? Seeing posters about it on the walls, seeing TV commercials about their medicines. And they say, hey, I take that one. That's for HIV. Wouldn't you rather do it in a controlled manner where you can discuss things openly with them than them finding out some other way like that? where they can't get support, they can't get their questions answered, and they can't dispel some of the myths that they might believe. It's better to do it in a controlled situation. And of course, if you're keeping secrets, that's increasing the stigma, isn't it? If you write on a patient's card, testing done 25, well, guess what that does? That's adding to the stigma, doesn't it? You write on their chart, RVD, retroviral disease. You're adding to the stigma. It's HIV. Be open about it. It's not a secret. You don't keep secrets when somebody has cancer, when they have pancreatic cancer, which has a worse prognosis than HIV. When somebody has diabetes, when somebody has blood pressure, you don't use a special code about it when writing in their chart. Why do you do that for HIV? Because of stigma. And you're adding to it. Patients are adding to it by keeping secrets. We're adding to it by keeping it secrets, by using code names, by using numbers instead of talking about HIV. It's simply a viral infection. That's all it is. So is measles. So is polio. We don't use codes for those. We don't use special names for them. That's all HIV is. But we add to the stigma. Patients add to the stigma. Caregivers add to the stigma by using secrets. Early disclosure can lead to better adjustment. Sorry, this is a question? A 
I'm going to talk about that. The question is, how do you do it? How long does it take to do it? I'm going to answer that later in this lecture. So early disclosure can lead to better adjustment. So early disclosure of cancer patients is associated with better psychosocial adjustment amongst cancer survivors. And then five to 10 year old children who are aware of their HIV status also in some research studies have showed better ways of coping, better coping mechanisms of dealing with hardships of other things, not just of HIV. There was one study done um, looking at disclosure um, as a continuous variable, so different, me- uh, different ways of disclosing and knowing different types of disclosure, knowing different pieces of information. The more that they knew, the better they did. The more that they knew about what HIV, and the more that they understood, they had better psychosocial support. They had improved self-confidence, and they had decreased problem behavior. Like the child who thought she had worms in the stomach. She became a behavior problem because she wasn't disclosed to, because she was lied to. With increasing degrees of disclosure, all of these things improved. The better, the more they knew about it, the better they did. The higher self-esteem, the more support that they actually received, and the less problem behavior that they had. There was one study done on children between the ages of 8 and 18 who had HIV who had disclosed their own HIV status to their friends. And what they actually found was that those children that had disclosed to their friends actually had higher CD4 counts than those that did not. And how is that possible? Does simply saying the words, I have HIV, increase your CD4 count? Probably not. But what would happen to those children who did disclose, were open about it, and told people that they're HIV positive. Well, they're likely to get more support, aren't they? They're likely to have a bigger circle of people who can remind them to take their medicines, rather than somebody who's keeping it a secret from everybody. Maybe nobody can remind them. Maybe they haven't told anybody. But somebody who's told their friends, their friend can say, hey, did you take your medicine this morning? and they can have better adherence. And that can lead to higher CD4s, less chance of getting resistance. In another study done um, uh, in children age uh, 9 to 15, this was done in Puerto Rico, they looked at all the children who were disclosed. And then they asked them about the event of disclosure, when they were disclosed to. Was this a positive experience or was it a negative experience? Well, 85% of them reported disclosure as a positive experience. 100% who considered disclosure negative, so those 15%, admitted to having gone on uh, accidental disclosure prior to the study. So they were like the child who already knew her HIV status, like the one with the grandmother I told you about. That was, for her, probably a traumatic experience the time that we disclosed to her. It was probably not a positive experience on that day in that time. Why? Because we realized about that strained relationship between her and her grandmother. So, in this study, all of those children who said that that experience was not positive, it was not good, it's because they already knew their HIV status. But that was the day that they learned that their parents were lying to them. Or that it came out to their parents that now they must start telling the truth. So the question, when do we do it? Some people say, 10 years old. You should start doing disclosure at age 10. Some people say, no, 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 that's too young. 13, that's when we should do it. No, 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 no. That's too young. You know, it's too stressful to do to a teenager. Maybe we should wait till she's 15. No. There's no right age for disclosure. Every child is different. And disclosure is a process. It starts on the day the child first comes to me. I don't care how old they are. If they can speak to me, you can start disclosure. And there's a way to do it in an age-appropriate way and communicate about chronic illness and to children. And any, at any age, if they can talk to you, they can start the process of disclosure. So the answer is not 10 years old. 
It's not 12, it's not 13, it's not 15. As soon as they can start talking to you, as soon as they come to the clinic. I have five-year-olds in my clinic that can tell you everything about HIV. More so, and they have a better understanding of it than a lot of adults. Because they started at a young age. Now, they may not even know the words HIV. They may not even understand what that means. But they know why they're taking treatment. And they can understand why they're taking treatment. And I'll show you that. So what I often hear is, you know, when are you going to disclose to your child? When should we do it? When are you going to start talking about it? Oh, when she's ready. That's the answer the parents often give me. Well, when is she going to be ready? When is the child going to be ready? Is there a day suddenly yesterday she wasn't ready and today she is? I had one parent say to me, you know, the child was 14, still not disclosed to you. I said, well, when are you going to do it? Well, she says, not now because, you know, he's writing exams now. He's writing exams. It's going to be too stressful if I do it now. And I said, well, then when, when will it not be stressful? It's always going to be a stressful event. And it has to happen. You have to do it. And then the next time the child comes in, well, not today because this is actually true, the same child, not now because it's almost his birthday. And I don't want you know, to mess around with his birthday. And then the next time it'll be something else and something else and something else. So that's not a good answer. It should start early as soon as the child starts taking medicine. If the child starts taking medicine as a child and is too young to talk, as soon as they can talk with you, you can start introducing the concepts. The American Academy of uh, Pediatrics basically says this statement. The doctor should serve as advocates for their children into care of their patients. They should anticipate the need for eventual disclosure in caring for HIV-infected children. Don't tell them a lie, because eventually they're going to have to know the truth. Right? We should anticipate a point in time where they have to know about HIV. You need to inform parents that if older children question them about their HIV status, then they should answer directly and truthfully. If a child asks a parent, why do I need to take this medicine? You should answer them. You shouldn't say, I'll tell you when you get older. No, that means the child's ready to, to know. It's a common answer. I, I've asked many, many, many parents this question. Has a child ever asked you why they take treatment? And they say, yes, it actually happens. And I say, what do you tell them? And I get all different answers. Some say, well, I'll tell you when you get older. Or that it's because you're sick. Or it's because of TB. That's another very common one I get. Well, all of these are not true. You don't tell a child they're taking medicines for TB when it's HIV. Because they're going to learn that they don't have TB. This is lifelong treatment. You can't keep it a secret forever. So I always, whenever I, I initiate a child, even in a small child, I remind patients, the parents this, that you need to be open about it. If a child's asking about why they take treatment, you need to tell them. Maybe you don't tell a five-year-old, you take treatment because you have HIV. They're not going to know what that means. But there is a way that you can tell that child something that is the truth that will help them understand. Maybe you just tell them, maybe a four-year-old child or a five-year-old child, maybe all you tell them is, you take your medicines to stay healthy. That's true, isn't it? It's not a lie. It's something that they understand. And then you can build upon that when they get older, when they start to understand more and start to understand that, then you can build upon that. And it should be a partnership. It should not be a one-on-one -on -one thing. It should not be the doctor and the patient or the parent and the patient. It should be everybody together. Another one that I often hear is, no, I'll do it at home. I'll disclose to the child at home. And that's fine if you want to do that. But I often ask them, well, how many times have you disclosed to a child? And their answer is zero. How many times has our clinic disclosed to a child? The answer is several hundred times we've done it. So we have experience in it. We know how to do it. 
And we know what some of the responses are likely to be and how to deal with them. Parents don't. So it's better. The parent can do it in a controlled situation, but they should do it in front of us. Now, if they want to do it on their own, they're welcome to it. I don't tell them, no, you can't do it at home. But there sometimes is a better way to do it. And sometimes it's a process that should always involve the parent and tell the parent, well, here's a good way to do it at home. Don't just tell the child, you have HIV, that's it, goodbye. But there are ways to do it and properly, and you can give the parent a bit of training if they want to do it at home. So when to discuss uh, the family readiness. So the caregivers need to be ready to discuss the child with the, with the child, even if they're not ready to introduce the terminology. As I said, tell a young child they take medicines to stay healthy. They may not have to say the words HIV, but they can say something. Okay, teach the family that it's a process. It's not a one-time event. Disclosure doesn't take place today. Today is the day we disclose to the child. No. It starts when the child is young, starts when the child starts taking medicine if they're older, and is a continual process that you build upon at each visit. So how do you do it? It depends. You start at an age-appropriate level. I disclose very differently to a 5-year-old than to a 15-year-old, than to a 10-year-old, than to a 7-year-old. They're all different. And it should be incremental, small steps, teaching them small steps, small things, a bit at a time, find out what they know, and then build upon it. And it should be supportive, and it should involve the family and healthcare team. It should involve everybody. So, I'm going to skip that. It's not important. <laughs> um, so how do you uh, disclose to a small child? Well, as I said, to a small child, a five-year-old child, what would I start with? Well, you start with simple language in a language that they can understand. Tell them the nature of their illness, that they have something in their blood, that it's a bad guy, that it's Iqtawan, or it's a germ, something that they understand and tell them how they can care for themselves by taking medicines every day. By taking medicines every day, you can stay healthy, you can stay strong, you can live to be an adult. And the diagnosis and the prognosis is not a priority in a small children. They don't think in those terms. They don't care about the words HIV. They don't care what it is they have. They don't think about the long-term future. They want to care about now. Why do I have to swallow these tablets? to stay healthy, to stay strong, so you don't get sick. Um, yeah, as I said, they're only interested in the near future and what's happening now. Okay? It's partial disclosure, we call this. And it's very important, and this is the, the, probably the most important part about this lecture, is to always tell the truth. Because this is a chronic illness, the child is going to learn about it someday. If you've lied to them, they're going to figure it out at some point. You're going to have to tell them the truth. And then, how do you undo that lie? How do I tell that child, no, it's not worms in your stomach, it's HIV? You have to undo what you've already done. It's not asthma, as what one of the clinics in Durban was telling all their children. No, it's not asthma, it's HIV. How do you undo that? It's not easy. So you shouldn't start it in the first place. Don't tell a child who has HIV that they take medicines for asthma because they don't have asthma. They have HIV. They're going to learn that, and then you have to undo all that problem. And then are they going to trust you as your doctor in the future? No. Are they going to trust other doctors in the future? No. They've been lied to. It will be very difficult to undo, so you should always tell the truth. In an older child, once they start becoming school age, it's very strongly recommended that you begin the process. A school age child can have a conversation with you, they can talk to you, they can understand simple terms. So you should definitely start the process by the time they start in school. Discuss a plan for disclosure for the parents. If the child is asking about it, why are they taking medicines, why do they take treatment, the parents need to answer them honestly. 
you need to do a correct child assessment. Not all children will understand all of the concepts. Some of them have learning disabilities. And you may have to explain in a different way. And in this age, you can give more specific information, not just you take medicines to stay healthy. That might be where you start, but then build upon that. And tell them more specific pieces of information. And assist in developing coping responses. We know a lot of the coping responses that they're likely to get when they learn more and more. We'll tell them and anticipate what some of those might be. And also talk about who and what to tell others. We often tell them, you know, this is not something that everybody knows and not everybody understands. Oftentimes the children understand more and understand better than the adults do. So they should be careful at who they tell these things to. Because oftentimes, because of stigma, because of people's fears, it might not be a good idea to tell everybody these sorts of things. And this is a common one I get from the doctors, from the nurses, from the counselors. But our clinic is too busy. We see 200 patients a day. I can't do this. It's not possible. Well, my clinic is busy. All the clinics are busy. And there is time to do it. It doesn't take very long, particularly if you do it as a process, particularly if you start early. You give them little pieces of information each time they come. See what they already know and build upon it. It takes a few seconds to ask somebody, why do you take your treatment? They say, I don't know. Well, you can simply, even when writing the prescription, do some disclosure or have the counselors do it while you're writing. So, how do you start? Where do you begin? Well, a good and easy and non-judgmental way to start is start by asking, by telling them that you take medicines to stay healthy. Very simple concept. And that you can talk to a four-year-old, a five-year-old, they can understand that, that message. And then, once they're taking medicines for a while, ask them, do they know when they take their treatment? And many children, most children, by the time they're five years old, they tell you, I take it at seven o'clock, seven o'clock, or half six and half six. By now, oftentimes they're reminding the parents, oh, it's seven o'clock, I have to take my medicine. As a child is entering school, learning time, they know the times of the medicines. And then how do they take their medicines? Okay. Can they pick out the medicines from the medicines on the table? How many of the yellow ones do they take? How many of the white ones do they take? Can they show you? And then once they start learning that thing, once they start in school, once they start learning their alphabet, can they tell you the names of the medicines? You would be surprised at how young children I have that can tell me the names of their medicines. Some five years old can tell me the names of their medicines. Many of my adult patients cannot tell me the names of their medicines. But a five-year-old child can because we review it over and over and over again. And it's always give positive messages. Always when talking to children, stress positive, positive messages. And then how do you build upon that? Once they know the names of their medicine, they know the times, they know the proper doses, you build upon it. Start telling them stories in a way that they can understand. Teach them about soldiers of the body, Masosham Zimba. Simple concept they can understand. That there's soldiers in the body that keep them healthy, that keep them strong. As long as those soldiers are healthy and strong, then you're healthy and strong. Recognize that health problems are less because your soldiers are strong, they can protect you. If you don't have a lot of soldiers in the body, other things can come and make you sick. You can get running stomach and cough and headache and skin rash. Okay, all of those are things that children know and understand. I don't tell them you can get PCP pneumonia, you can get TB. They're not going to know what that is. But they know what coughing is. They know what a skin rash is. They know what running stomach is. All of these things they can get because they don't have a lot of soldiers. And say as long as you have lots of soldiers, as long as your soldiers are strong, they can fight off these things and you stay healthy. And we stress positive messages. Once they understand that, you can build upon that and say, well, there's also in the blood, there's a bad guy. There's a germ. There's a virus. There's a nikmewane. 
that can get you. He's trying to kill the soldiers. That Ichnawana is trying to kill the Masosha. That virus is trying to kill the soldiers. Right? They can understand that. They're told stories every day. They watch cartoons. They see this on TV. They hear stories about bad guys and good guys. They know this. They can understand this. Once they understand that, and then you simply tell them, you know what, you take your medicines. What your medicines do, you take them every day, you take them morning, you take them at night. It makes that it makes that virus, makes that germ, makes the bad guy go to sleep. And then I always ask, if that germ, if that bad guy, if the Iktawana is asleep, can he kill your soldiers? No, he's asleep, right? Just like a lion sleeping, you can sneak on by, right? If he's asleep, he can't hurt you. And they understand that. Simple concept. That they understand, and now they know how HIV works. Now they understand how HIV works. And once they understand it, they get the concept they take their medicines, makes the bad guy go to sleep, they get lots of soldiers, soldiers protect them. Now what do we do? Now you can attach labels to things that they already understand, they already know. What is your soldier? What is your misocial? Well, that's called CD4. Simply a name that we give him. He's called CD4. What's the virus? What's the bad guy? What's the Ikhtawane? Well, his name is HIV. Now you haven't added to any stigma. You haven't distressed the child. It's just now a label, now a name, another name that they can call that virus, the Ikhtawane, the bad guy, the germ. It's just a name for him. That's all HIV is. CD4 is a name of our soldier. Doesn't add to stigma, does not traumatize them. It's a con concept that they've already known, they've already understood. Now we've just given it a name. Whenever you tell them the name, whenever I say, okay, you've told me the soldier story, I ask them, why do you take your medicine? To make the Ikhnawana go to sleep, to make the virus sleep so that my soldiers and my body stay high. They know it. Now I tell them their labels. But then I say, you know, that virus, the bad guy, he's the Ikhtawane, his name is HIV. And I don't stop there. I say, what, have you heard that word before? Have you heard of HIV? Some say yes, some say no. Some have never even heard of it. But if they have heard of it, you say, what have you heard about it? Because at that time, you can dispel a lot of myths, a lot of things that they may have heard from other people that are not true. I remember one child back when I first started and there were a lot of negative ad campaigns. She said, oh, I have that, HIV. But HIV kills. That's what the ads say. That's what they say on TV. HIV kills. But I said, no, you already understand the concept. You already understand that it only kills if you're not taking treatment. So we could take that reference out of her mind. And the negative image she had of HIV, she already understood that that's not what it was. You can dispel those myths, beliefs that people may already have about HIV. So why does this work? It's because it sets the stage and they already understand the concept before they know the names. And it's not the name that's important, it's the concept that's important. It empowers the child with knowledge. Now they understand why they're coming to the clinic. It encourages positive self-esteem. It gets them involved in their care. I have small children, seven years old, that when I go to draw their blood, they don't cry. Why do they not cry when I draw their blood? They freely give me their arm and say, I can't wait, tell me how many soldiers do I have next time? Because last time I only had, you know, 400. I want it to be 700 this time. I say, ah, tell me, is my virus still asleep? Last time it was asleep. I'm going to find out next time when I come back. Go ahead, draw my blood. I want to know, is my virus still asleep? They get involved in their care. They understand the concept. They know why we're drawing blood. I always tell them, do you know why we draw your blood? Very simple, two things. We count your soldiers of your body and check if the virus is asleep. 
Very simple. And now they know why we're taking blood. We're not just causing them pain. It's to check on how they're doing. Otherwise, we're just sticking a needle in their arm and it hurts. But now they understand why we do it. So at my clinic, we talk about the soldiers of the body every time. I have posters of the soldiers in my room, on the walls. Children talk about it all the time and openly and freely about it. And they understand the concept. It takes a few seconds to do. Ask them what do they already know? Why do they take their treatment? Do they know the names of their medicines? And find out what they know and then build upon it at each visit. It's very simple to do. So how does it work? Well, most counseling sessions are brief and easily incorporated into a regular visit. People say, I don't have time. Well, I incorporate it into my regular visit. You can do it while examining a child. Ask them the names of their medicine. Ask them why they take their medicines. You can do it when writing their prescription out. You can have the counselors do it afterwards and find out what they know and build upon it. It's a very simple concept and it only takes a minute or two minutes. And as I mentioned, when you use the words HIV AIDS for the first time, it is important to have a little bit of extra time to see what do they already know about it. What have they learned about it? What have they heard from school, from classmates, from friends, maybe heard otherwise? Because there's lots of myths out there. There's lots of things that people don't understand about. And so that we can dispel some of those myths. So why do people fear disclosure? It's because it's the fear of the unknown, like the white elephant in the room. Right? It's still there. If there's a large white elephant in the room, well, ignoring it is not going to make it go away. It's still there. You have to address the problem. How do we get it out of here? That's what disclosure does. It doesn't ignore the problem. It addresses it directly. It makes it open and free. But if my child knows her status, she's going to tell others. Very common statement I get. And I say, you know what? It's true. It's possible. But we tell them who they should tell this to. Tell them that they, others don't understand about HIV. Others don't understand as much as you do. And that's very true. A lot of adults don't understand why they need to take treatment. They don't even understand the soldier's story. They don't understand the concept in that simple way. So they're not going to understand if you tell them. They may think other things. They may think things that are not true. So when I do it, I always congratulate the child for what they already know. If they, know the, they only know the names of their medicines, well, that's great. That's better than most adults. If they only know the times of their medicine, that's great. They're learning. They're becoming involved in their care. They can pick out the names or pick out what the colors are, what the pills look like. They're learning. They're becoming involved in their care. Remind the child that many people don't understand as much as they do. As I said, the adults, we don't spend as much time and we don't focus on adults like we do on the children. Although we should, we should incorporate the same disclosure process to adults so that they understand the same concept. And other people, they might believe negative things about HIV, but not, they already know more than these people. They're more educated than these people and they understand it even better. We always stress positive things and stress talking about the parent to the caregiver before they talk to other people about HIV. They should know who they're telling and what they're talking about. Okay. Another common one I get from the mothers is, if he knows he has HIV, he's going to blame me. He's going to say, I gave him HIV. It's my fault. Well, we stress positive messages, not negative things. You don't say your mother gave it to you. You simply say you got it when you were born. It's the same thing, right? But it takes the blame off of the mother. It's not her fault. I bet you that mother would give up anything in the world not to have that child be positive. She didn't do it on purpose. It just happened. If she could have avoided it, she absolutely would have. So it's not that her mother gave it to her or gave it to him, just that he or she got it when she was born. So establish goals, small bits of information that can be done in pieces, a little bit at a time. So children, when they're disclosed, they can be very happy, they can understand, and it's not very traumatic. So where do you start? How do you start? 
Very simple. I start with pictures, and I start with this guy. He's the Masosha. He's the soldier. Soldier of the body. So I show them pictures and ask them questions. What is this picture? What does he do? What is he carrying? They say, oh, he's carrying a gun. Well, what do, you, what do people do with guns? Well, they shoot people. What does a soldier do? They shoot people. Well, do they shoot anybody? No. They shoot the bad guys. Their job is to protect people, to keep them healthy, to keep them strong. That's what this picture is showing. It's a soldier. His job is to protect us, to keep us healthy, to keep us safe. Just as a regular soldier would do, there's soldiers of the body. There's Masoshim Zimba in the body that keep you healthy, keep you strong. As long as you have lots of soldiers, you stay healthy, you stay strong. If something tries to make you sick, you know, a virus, a bug tries to give you running stomach, you have lots of soldiers, it can protect you. Something's coming trying to give you a cough, these can protect you. As long as you have lots of soldiers, you stay healthy, you stay strong. But inside the blood, there's something else. There's an ichthawani, there's a virus, there's a germ, there's HIV. And it's trying to kill the soldier. So they understand this. Good guys, bad guys. The bad guy is trying to kill the good guy that's trying to protect me. Simple concept. So, if there's lots of virus, lots of bad guy, lots of ichthawani, lots of HIV in the blood, it's killing the soldiers. You'll get less and less soldiers. The soldiers can't protect you. The soldiers are too busy fighting this other thing, this bad guy. It's trying to make you sick. So now, something can come, cough, running stomach, headache, skin rash. They can come and get you and make you sick. And you're vulnerable to these things. You won't stay healthy. You might start losing weight. These are all things that children understand. Loss of appetite, things that they understand that are very real to them. And then, if you don't have anything, now this is something I usually show older kids and teenagers and even adults, that if you don't have any soldiers, then anything can come and get you and make you sick and you can die. But if you take your medicines, if you take your ARVs, their job is to make that virus, the Ictawane, the HIV, the bad guy, whatever you want to call it, to make him go to sleep. If he's sleeping, he can't kill your soldiers, he can't hurt your soldiers. You get lots more soldiers in the body. They stay healthy, they stay strong, and they can now protect you. As long as they take the medicine morning, at night, twice a day, three medicines, that virus stays asleep. The virus stays asleep, they stay healthy, they stay strong. This is a picture that I really, really like. Because it shows a concept about HIV that I even show this to my adult patients. This is one when they have lack of adherence, they're missing doses. This is the first thing I show them. What is this picture of here? A pot, right? A cooking pot with how many legs? Three, Three legs. How many ARVs do we take? Three. Three. What happens if I take one of these legs away? <laughs> Pots will fall. Whatever's inside spills out, right? Same is true with ARVs. You don't take one or you don't take any of them. It's like pulling the legs off the pot. It spills out. So what if that virus was sleeping? You were taking your treatment well. We've got a nice pot of boiling water here. And we don't take one. We stop taking our stokerin. Oops, my pictures are out of order. So what happens? The pot spills, right? So you have boiling hot water spills on the virus. Who is asleep? Is that going to wake him up? Yeah. When he wakes up, is he going to be happy or is he going to be pretty mad? Yeah, he's going to be mad. And he's going to get stronger, isn't he? Because he's mad. He's been woken up by boiling water. So he's going to get really mad. 
and he gets stronger. And guess what? He figures out the secrets of the medicines. So now, even if you take your treatment well, even if you take it every day on time, guess what? He's figured out the secrets. He now has armor. Those ARVs, they're not making him sleep anymore, is it? He's awake. You're taking your ARVs, but he's still awake. He's figured out the secrets of the medicines. He's got armor now. He's protected by them. It doesn't make him sleep anymore. Now we've taught a child about resistance, haven't we? Difficult concept to understand. Very easy to a child with pictures, isn't it? So this is a great way to tell, tell teenagers, older children, about resistance, about taking their medicines very well, why they need to take it. This right here explains my whole adherence lecture, doesn't it? In five slides, you understand why you need to take treatment every day, what happens if you don't, right here. Show them a few more pictures sometimes. Now these are not ones I show every time, but sometimes. This is reminding them that when they travel on school holidays, you need to take your treatment with you. You need to take it every day. So when you travel, you take your treatment. This is about having a treatment supporter. Helps when somebody else is there to remind you about taking your treatment. This is somebody who hasn't taken their treatment, right? What happens? Well, the virus wakes up, just like this. They've forgotten their medicines, the virus can wake up, become stronger, and then the medicines might not work anymore. With ARVs, children can have a normal lifespan. They can be in school, they can play sports, they can get a job and study, they can get married, they can have children, and live a normal life. But without treatment, HIV will kill them eventually. So they can get sick. You know, you might look fine for now, but then you might get sick start to lose weight, start to lose energy and strength, become bed-bound, and then you could die. Now, I don't show this to all children. Of course, a five-year-old I'm not going to show this to. But a teenager who's having poor adherence, who can understand these concepts, absolutely. They need to know. It's true. Without treatment, they can die. This is another one that I show. Once a child is fully disclosed, once he's maybe age 12 or 13, they need to know about how does somebody get HIV. Because at that age, they might start to become sexually active. They need to know that they could pass on HIV or they could get another type of HIV. So that we show them that they, sex without condoms can, have, can pass on HIV. They can get it when the mother's pregnant. They can get it from sharing sharp objects or blood, or needles. They can get it when they're born, or even through breastfeeding, and that's really it. That's the only ways to get HIV. And then, of course, encourage them to be open about it. If they have any questions, they can always call the clinic, talk to the counselors, we give them a, the number to the clinic. If they want to talk about anything, if they're having problems, they should be open and free to talk about. Okay. Any questions? So that shows you disclosure is not difficult. It's very easy to do. You all now have those pictures in your handouts. You can use them yourselves. And I encourage you all to start disclosing to kids. Okay. Any questions?